Hello, good afternoon. Thanks for, uh, for coming. We're going to be talking about some really cool topics. So, why the cool kids don't use Erlang? Oh, let me, uh, the track host is not available, so uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Garrett Smith, programmer at CloudBees. Um, you might know some of the videos I've, I've done, Erlang, the movie, uh, part two, the, the sequel, of course, but the sequel, uh, not the original. Uh, MongoDB is WebScale. So that's my side project. Um, I like to use Erlang. I use Erlang as much as I can uh, on a daily basis. I think it's a great language, and I'm a fanboy. I mean, I'm, I'm the most rabid that you'll see. But I want to try to breathe some sobriety into my own enthusiasm here. So I'm just going to kind of calm down, and we're going to talk sort of rationally today. So incidentally, uh, Throwing tomatoes and other things is fun, but do it on Twitter. It's even more fun when you do it on Twitter. Um, so use the hashtag EUC2014, and that's me. Look forward to the abuse. Okay. So the cool kids, that's an indirection of an indirection. The first indirection comes from, and I don't know if this is sort of worldwide, but it's in the U.S. there's sort of this, you know, a niche or a clique called the cool kids. The cool kids are the kids in the, in the, the playground. They're always dressed cool, and they have, you know, the, the best girlfriends and boyfriends, and those are the cool kids. And, you know, I was never a cool kid, so you like to make fun of the cool kids. So, you, you know, you study hard, and you learn Erlang and do other things, and you make fun of the cool kids. So that's the first indirection. The second indirection is the video called All the Cool Kids Use Ruby, and this is, of course, me making fun of sort of technology fas fashionistas. Uh, technologists, so-called, who allow um, aesthetics or the sense of beauty, um, but in a sort of capricious, weird, arbitrary sense, rather than physics, rather than hard engineering problems. So it, this, it's right for fun. Uh, if you haven't seen the video, you can now, and afterwards you'll, you'll know what the heck I'm talking about here. But as it applies to today, um, oh, let me go through, uh, yeah, eh, let me back up a second. So as it applies today, um, Erlang is, is, is probably, you can appreciate that in this room, Erlang is very popular. Fair, we're in EUC, and it's in Stockholm. So I think it's safe to say that Erlang is very, very popular here, but in general, Erlang is not that popular. Okay, so here we have a two-dimensional plot of languages. Uh, the bottom axis here is popularity rank on GitHub and popularity rank on Stack Overflow. Everyone can see that fine? I mean, I can barely see it here, so, uh, you know. So let me point out where Erlang is. There are a couple of a few neighborhoods here. I'm going to point these out. Erlang is up here. And there are two neighborhoods that I can kind of spot. There's the super, this is really the popular group. This is popularity up here. This is kind of another neighborhood. We've got Scala, Haskell, Clojure, Lua, Erlang, CoffeeScript, Go, ActionScript, Groovy. Uh, Erlang is, is over here. Up here we have Java. JavaScript, PHP, C Sharp, Ruby, C++. You've heard of these. You've heard of probably most of these. CSS, you've heard of CSS. So Erlang is not in the top. And th here's another view. And this kind of shows you, um, this is a uh, Langpop. Um, this is an index generated by a weighting of other um, particular sources. And in this case, it's an even weight of GitHub, Google Files, Olo, Craigslist, and Google Search. So it's a different view, but we have a similar neighborhood. So here we have Erlang grouped again with the, s the usual suspects. Scala, uh, Lua, Ada, uh, Ada, sorry, Pascal, Haskell, uh, Lips, Closure, Erlang, there it is, right above Fortran. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so, so, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know if it's controversial for me to say that the cool kids don't use Erlang. I'm pretty sure it's not. I mean, I'm not here, but in general. So, so what's the basis of it? Wh wh why am I even doing this thing? This is motivated by what I call the bike shed thread in the Erlang user questions list. And this happened uh, a couple months ago. And it was very interesting, because not much actually happens that's sort of passionate and, and emotional in the Erlang list. And uh, people like that somehow. I get bored there. I'm like, well, I want some excitement. So we had somebody from the Java community come in, and we had some people from Zero MQ community come in. And they were new, and they were interested in, in learning more about Erlang. And there was a, uh, one thread that was started. And it, had, it started with this topic of OTP and renaming OTP. And um, it sort of went into a whole bunch of other things, and it seemed to, to center, at least from my point of view, on topics of usability and grokkability, understanding Erlang. That was my interpretation. So, of course, this is a really interesting topic to me. I'm passionate about usability, grokkability, teaching, adoption, getting people onto, the pl you know, onto using Erlang and solving great problems with this tool. So I was just being, being I was like, yeah, okay, great, that's a great question. So, and I would get pinged, literally, offline private messages on email from my friends saying, 
Stop feeding the trolls. Don't do that. Don't. You're ruining everything. This is terrible. And I'm like, I, I was just like, what are you talking about? I mean, we're having, I thought, a reasoned discussion about, you know, these different topics. And, and it, it's like, what? So, so okay, fine. Uh, you're getting emotional. This is unusual. Um, you're directing at me. Uh, okay, that's fine. What is the problem here? So the problem seemed to be this topic of bike shedding. So a bike shedding, I, I had I'd never heard this before. I'd, so I had to look it up. So Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia did it, and uh, here we go. It's a really, really good descriptive term. It um, comes from a story from uh, uh, C. Parkinson back in uh, 1957 or so, uh, and it was talking about a, an atomic energy facility, a uh, reactor, and the discussion was brought up about a very technical, a technical problem, and very few people even understood the problem, and so very few people contributed to the discussion. But then the agenda moved to the color of the bike shed, and everyone could understand the color of the bike shed, and everyone had an opinion. So the debate was roaring and, and, and very robust, and, and, and so there's this descriptor to describe what happens in a list or in a community um, or a discussion around something that people consider to be trivial. Well, it, you know, it's trivial, but really what it is is it's, it's easily understood. And the topic of what you name something, what you call something, everybody can sort of intuitively understand, and everyone has an opinion. And so we had this rallying of opinions about how to understand something and how to describe something and how to think. And I'm just like, yes, this is really, really important stuff. But there was a huge element, a huge element. I mean, there were people like, what happened to the Erlang list? I'm resigning. I, oh, uh, oh this is terrible. Let's fork the entire thing. And, and the issue here is very reasonable. It is a bike shedding dynamic where there are a lot of people on the list who are very concerned about hard problems. And that's why people like Erlang. That's why people like the list. It's why people like the community. Brilliant community. Brilliant people discussing very, very difficult problems. And so when it seemed, it felt like we were now moving into territory which was the color of the bike shed. Oh my goodness, what, what could possibly uh, be worse for, for, uh, for Erlang? So um, I handle emotions, you know, I try to like buckle down and get really rational. So I'm like, well, what's going on here? It seems to me a dichotomy. You've got, you know, on the one hand, people who just don't think adoption, usability, will you name something, the learning process, et, et cetera, is that important? Because really, at the end of the day, if you have a hard enough problem, you'll power through that stuff. And we do that. If we have a hard enough problem, we will push through all the barriers to adoption and we'll adopt it. So they've done it, I've done it, you've done it, we've all done it. So when somebody comes in and just like, look, if your problem isn't hard enough or challenging enough to solve with Erlang can, to justify your investment in reading, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then maybe you would be more at home someplace else. And, you know, respectfully, respectfully, except to me offline. <laughs> um, so what I want to do in this case is I actually want to measure this. So what's important to you, what's important to me, what's, you know, it, there is no absolute standard, but what we can do is ask. And we can do some, uh, you know, some science. Maybe it's amateur science, but we can nonetheless do science. And we can say, what is important? You know, what is the problem? You know, what, you know, what, et cetera. You know, and then collect this and measure it. So what this is, is data. So I'm providing data. Now, again, as a, as a sort of scientific, you know, uh, data scientist, statistician, this is probably, this is probably not the, the, the material for a thesis. So if those are you want to poke holes in methodology, et cetera, that's fine. I accept that. But it is some observation. And I'm going to try to uh, you know, do as good, uh, um, elaborate what the methodology is and, and uh, uh, how things are computed, et cetera. So you can poke holes in it. But what for me this is, is simply an observation. And when you have data, it changes the way you think, maybe for good or for bad. It lets you, th it lets you think differently. And then it informs your next decision. That's my expectation here. This is not to go measure and come up with a bunch of firm conclusions. Not at all. I have some speculative questions, some, some possible things to think about. But this is really about measurement. And so I'm not going to try to push past that. OK, so let's talk about the survey methodology. So what I want to do is talk about what the survey is so you have an idea of what I was asked. So out of curiosity, how many people filled the survey? And this is the Erlang survey. One. Oh, OK. There's Five. Thank you. That's right. No. Um, and, and so this is a big community. We got a lot of results, and I deliberately went outside the community, in within the community, outside, and we have the data on you know sort of different collectors, uh, how the original messages went out, um, and we can differentiate that. So if people want to dive in, the data sets are available. The summarized data sets are available. So they're anonymized. If somebody wants to go do more, you know, harder science on this, uh, it, it's available. 
But the methodology in general is fairly simple. I didn't want to prescribe a bunch of, I didn't want to make this difficult. So I just said, you know, type this in. Um, so there are questions that are freeform questions. So the content that we're going to look at today uh, is, uh, is, is freeform apart from demographics. Um, I wanted this to be completed in five, five minutes or less. I didn't want to burden people. Um, I wanted enough people to get into this and provide input so that we would have something that was significant um, in size. So I have demographics, as I said, for control. I tried to create questions that I felt were a minimal set. Um, so basically every question was, was, th was, you know, the answers could theoretically be useful. So I didn't want to ask something that was, was uh, not useful. Okay, so here are the freeform questions. Uh, very simply, what is your general impression of Erlang? So this allows somebody to just to type. Not, there's, no, there's no prescription, good or bad. What's your impression? Some people said, great. And other people wrote, you know, four, par four detailed paragraphs. So that was the goal. Whatever's on your mind, tell me. For what situations, the second question, for what situations would you consider using Erlang? So I was interested to understand how people perceived Erlang. So yes, a general impression, but more specifically, how would you apply this? So what problems do you, do you see Erlang as being useful for? Uh, and that would sort of inform, you know, help me to understand, help us to understand where folks are coming from when they look at Erlang. So what's the messaging and what's the perception about how you'd use this thing? What challenges do you see in adopting Erlang for a project? And this is, this is a very interesting question. Um, it's a softly put question. I, I, you know, it's just challenges. You know, I didn't want to say what problems you have. Um, I say, you know, in adopting Erlang, uh, these are carefully, I mean, I've thought about these, and I just, the, the goal is, look, just tell me what's our challenge, just, just kind of ease into it. And we got everything from, from very strong, you know, borderline emotional responses to, I have no idea why, you know, I, or uh, actually the, the other one would be, um, to, you know, no challenges at all, absolutely none, no barriers. So, a uh, wide range of responses. What languages or frameworks would you consider as alternatives to Erlang? So, um, interested in what other people are looking at. Um, I think this is useful. Uh, this could help us to look at those communities, those languages, to uh, you know, consider uh, how, how those are structured, functionally, technically, as well as culturally. Um, incidentally, this is not uh, necessarily an alternative to Erlang. Um, well, it is an alternative to Erlang. That's exactly what the question said. Many people didn't. Ma many people uh, said, "Well, I would use it, use something in addition to it." So, but that's what that's in the text. Um, what about Erlang or its ecosystem, libraries, community governance, et cetera, would you change? So this is the, you know, if you can wave a magic wand, how would you, how would you make things different? Okay, so these are the demographics. So those are the qualitative questions, so those are all text-based. These are the demographics. How many years have you been working with software? I'm going to kind of move through this because it's not that interesting. It's more used for control. If someone's interested in, like, you know, narrowing a field, this is available. Less than five years, between five and ten, and more than fifteen. Basically, I want to get an idea: Are you are you new to software? Are you ex, you know experienced over fifteen teen years? Or are you someplace in the middle? We'll look at the results in a minute. How many programmers do you wor work with on a regular basis? Primarily by myself, between one and five, and more than five. So this is my sort of split, easily grokked. Are you working individually on a small team or a large team? Now I consider more than five to be quite large today. Uh, historically, that is certainly not the case, but um, I think the results are okay. What is your role in choosing a language for a project? So this is sort of influence. Alas, I have no input, mu not much input. I provide some input, but ultimately someone else decides. I consider input from others, but usually have the final word. Okay. And uh, which one of these roles do you play in your organization? Are you a programmer, sort of a, a designer or an architect, or are you in the business side? And people could answer more than one of these. All right. Okay. So. I had 181 responses, and then just four were skipped because they, were, they didn't either fill information in or they were trolls, or you know, it's just four though, so it wasn't bad. Okay, how many years, so this is the demographic. So the question here is, who answered this? So this is gonna give you an idea of who participated. And it's, you know, I think the result of this will just show us that this is an informed group of people. So very few, you know, very new to software, um, and th those who had between 15 years and over 15 years, roughly split. Um, so we have the, this is an experienced group of developers. How many programs do you work with on a regular basis? You see a s relatively small amount by themselves, and then between you know, small team, what, roughly about a third, and then uh, more than five, so I would consider a large team, about half. And then uh, what is the role uh, that you use? Not much influence, I have some input. Ultimately, in the final word, you can see that by and large, people either have some influence or they are quite you know, they're the decision maker, ultimately. So we're talking, we're talking about an audience that, uh, that can make things happen. 
And finally, which of these roles do you play in the organization? Programmer, architect, designer, and that's the layout. So what's the conclusion here of this demographic? Um, I think it's reasonable to conclude these things. They're very experienced, work in teams, highly influential, highly technical, articulate. One of the things that impressed me by reading through these, one, you know, almost 180 surveys, people are very, very articulate and, re and respectful and thoughtful. Um, I can't believe the quality of these. I was, it was stunning t to see what the, the community has produced. Um, okay, so that's some background there. Let me talk about the free form. So this is the methodology. Avoid biasing with predefined options. We talked about that. Manually summarize the text fields into lists. And this took a while. So what I did is if somebody took the time to, to I read every one and I summarized every one. Somebody took the time to type something, I took the time to write it. I also took the time to think fairly hard about what they were saying and map their points into tags. And the tags represent sort of a representation of an idea. And I'll show you some examples of that. So this is a way that I can quantify this qualitative result. So the goal, again, was to get people to input, and then I want to be able to measure it. So this is a fairly labor-intensive process, but I think it's worth it. So then count the tags per question, and then represent these using a tag cloud. And we'll see what that looks like in a minute. Um, and then finally, in the tag cloud, you look at some, some things had some big outliers, and I was interested to see what things look like when you pluck the outliers out. Sometimes that's, that's just as interesting as, as, the, as, the, uh, as the first result. Okay, here is a sample answer and tag list. And this is representative of the quality of the response. I'll just read it. Relying on, so this is what about Erlang and its ecosystem would you change? So this is sort of, hey, can you have some constructive cr um, criticism here? Relying on GitHub is the de facto go-to location for Erlang libraries is a bit of a weakness. Having a non-commercial foundation supported master location, which can be mirrored for packages, would be a major plus. An additional concern is the way EEPs are managed and published. There's no real status, progress, indicators, etc. Documentation could be more friendly for users. The official documentation structure is a bit difficult is difficult to navigate and makes absolutely no sense when approached when approaching Erlang as a new user. I believe Erlangs.com is easier to navigate. I believe, etc. So now, when I took this. I said, okay, he talked about package management here. So I have package under manager. This is an Erlang, ter Erlang term. I'll show you the full term in a second. So, of course, I wanted to store the data as Erlang terms. Why wouldn't I? Um, package repository mentioned that, EEP process. And so I went through and sort of made these up, and then I normalized them so that there'd be consistency across them. It's not perfect. I'm sure that there are bugs. I'm sure that there are mistakes. But I think for practical applications and certainly in our discussion, it's, it's going to be effective. This is the, the result, and this data, the, the summarized data, they are, are available on a GitHub project, and I'll reference that at the end. But this is an example of, of going from the raw text to a summarized version. So this is an Erlang term. This is an ID. Um, so the collector means where it came from. This is the impression. Loved it. Uh, bad string support. Uh, application didn't mention anything here. Challenges, finding developers, alternatives, Aka Python, to change, etc. Okay, so with that, I can easily run a nice Erlang program in eScript, which is also available to count these, to generate uh, word, word lists so that we can graph them in a cl tag cloud. Make sense? Who's interested in the actual results here? Anyone? You guys want me to talk, talk about methodology? <laughs> I can go on about methodology. Who wants more methodology? I'm just kidding. Okay. Results. Okay. What is your general impression of Erlang? This is the first tag cloud, so prepare your eyes. So again, as you're looking at this and absorbing it, this is reflecting the number of counts of a particular word. The words themselves are normalized. So if somebody said, I loved it, I said love, or just loved it. So there's some, there's some you know, combinations here. And it's not perfect, but for the most part, we can see that Erlang loves things that are hard to learn. That's interesting. No, don't interpret it that way. This is tempting to think that, that Erlang developers are, are this community is masochistic. It, it, it's not the case. <laughs> These are simultaneous things. They exist in parallel. I love this thing, but also it's hard to learn. These things jump out. That is a big result. Passionate, passionate, passionate love. I mean, you've got other things like brilliant, fantastic, you know, life-changing, it's probably in there someplace, um, really overwhelming positive response, but also really overwhelming impression that this thing is a to learn. All right, so let me take these two outliers out. These are outliers. So I want to take these out of the cloud, the tag cloud, and then review it and let that sort of make an impact. So what do we see? When I remove love, 
and remove hard to learn? What does it look like? Joe? Joe's message has apparently gotten across to people. It is a concurrency-oriented language. You thought I was asking you a question. It's confused. Like, why are you talking to me? And why are you giving a presentation talking to me? <laughs> Joe's book has on there, you know, a concurrency or for programming for a concurrent world. Concurrency-oriented language. This has gotten across. People view it as a concurrent language. I think that's accurate. Uh, and I think that's good. But this is another outlier. So what's the next wave here? Now, this is get, gets a little bit more interesting, and things start to become a little bit more balanced. But, you know, simple, good, yeah, it's not bad. It's not love, but it's good. Oh, bad syntax, that kind of jumps out there. Functional, fault tolerant, you know, bad documentation, scalable. So, um, you know, the general impression, you get a feel of the results here. Okay. Remember, it's data. I'll do some interpreting uh, shortly. Oh, yeah, interpreting. So for uh, what situations would you consider using Erlang? Again, this is to understand, you know, do people, wh what do people think of this in terms of the application? And lo and behold, servers really pops up. And servers could be referenced as long-running daemons, daemons, um, uh, services, backends. So I sort of lump these together as servers. This just means software that runs on a server someplace. It's unattended. Um, so we, we, we see uh, some other things, but let's pluck servers out because it's such an outlier. Uh, and we have a, a more balanced view here. And this is generally the, the mantra, right, when you talk about Erlang. When, you, when your friends ask you, so what's the thing with Erlang that's so great? Well, it's fault tolerant. Where's fault, to fault tolerant, uh, concurrent, reliable. These are the types of applications or the types of problems people view Erlang as being good for. And web shows up here as an interestingly large representation. So it is, I don't think telco, sh you know, telco may show up someplace, but it's very small. So we did not pull Ericsson Erlang programmers, or necessarily people from this community. I, th I think five people raised their hand. So the people, at the community at large, um, shows web. Web is a central. You know, people have understood that Erlang as a concurrent language, as a nice server-based language, is good for ah web applications. That's you know, lo and behold. What challenges do you see in adopting Erlang for a project? So you might have a hard time seeing this because it's buried <laughs> in the middle. But if you look where I'm pointing, you see this little thing here. It's finding developers. When I read through this, I knew maybe a third of the way that this was going to be a huge outlier. I just knew it because it was just like finding developers, finding developers, finding developers. Fi oh, finding really? Finding developers is a problem. It's tempting, I think, right now to think, that's great. I'm an Erlang developer, and obviously they are in super high demand. This is actually not what this is saying. Let's go to the next one. I'm removing, I'm removing the outlier, right? I'm so we're going to look at it with the outlier removed. So what is this? I believe, and this is a bit of an interpretation, but it's based on this. I, I, you know, this is a summary of the results that are, that are in, in from this. It isn't because there's this huge demand for Erlang programmers and a limited supply. It's because there's a very small, non-volatile market for Erlang programmers. It's non-volatile, meaning there aren't a lot of transactions going on, people hiring. Now, we may think it is because we live in a fairly small, insulated community. When somebody gets a job, we're like, oh, that's great. There's a great, you know, it's, this, is, this, is, this is the general complaint. Hard to learn. Rem remember that one? It's hard to learn. That means it's difficult to get people to become there's friction, there's barriers there. Adoption, right? There's a problem. People will look at Erlang and say, it's not adopted, right? So that rep represents risk. Right? So there aren't a lot of jobs as a result. So there aren't a lot of Erlang programmers. Manager buy-in, very, very commonly cited uh, as, as a barrier. You know, how do I get this sold to my boss when nobody's using it? There aren't any programmers. So it's a bit of a vicious cycle. When you, ha you don't have a robust market, you don't have a robust market. Right? It's two sides, supply and demand. So it's difficult to seed a demand when you have a limited supply. It's limited to seed a supply when you have limited demand. And this, show, this shows up quite a bit in the survey. And then finally, I'm gonna, I've removed hard to learn here just to see, but you can see the same thing. Developer knowledge, manager buy-in pops out, adoption pops out. But then you see some of these, these you know, sort of ancillary or, or tertiary results, documentation, library completeness, commonly, commonly cited package management, build tools, complexity, type systems, et cetera. This is a good slide, I think. You take the first two outliers out, and this sort of gives you a good reflection of, of sort of the secondary, third, tertiary uh, uh, challenges that people have. 
what languages or frameworks would you consider as alternatives? This is sort of an interesting point. Um, very interesting in that, in the popularity indexes, this was the neighborhood for the most part. Go came up a lot. Scala and Clojure came up a lot. Haskell came up a lot. Interestingly, not surprisingly, none came up a lot. Strip Python or uh, Erlang is quite different. And you'd expect that. People understand that it is unique and there is no replacement, so that came up quite a bit. Python, Elixir, etc. Elixir is, I think this, this yeah, Akka. Akka, by the way, and Scala are, are, were, were tied in, in, in so th these results are, in some cases I left out Scala here, so Scala could have been a little bit bigger. But anyway, it gives you a feel for what people are looking at as alternatives to Erlang. What about Erlang, or its ecosystem, libraries, communities, governments, would you change? Any opinions here? Doesn't matter. Here, these are the results. All right, so there's an outlier here, again, buried. Actually, you know, there are a few here that pop out, but this one is quite big, documentation. It is cited in a huge percentage of the results. Problems with documentation, and in particular when we're talking about documentation, it's the idea of how do I get started, how do I do something. Uh, very few complaints about reference guides. Almost all of them had to do with getting started. How do I do something? Tutorials. How do I solve a particular problem with Erlang? Um, there, this, if I can speak to my own my personal experience, this is you know lacking. I think this is difficult, and it's certainly reflected in the results here. Let's take documentation out. What do we see? This is really this very good representation. I mean, this my my intuitive impression of having read this. Um, is consistent here. This shows up package management, package repository. The problem people have, one of the big problems, is how do I get software for my, you know, how do I get a JSON library? Uh, GitHub? Duh. We, well, there's like six of them out there. Well, obviously, you've got to try six of them and figure out, or you read the history and you ask on the list. It's not that hard. But for people who are used to, you know, Ruby or Python, where it's just like, boom, it's done. I moved on to my next actually interesting problem. No, I don't really care that much about parsing JSON. Uh, that mindset gets frustrated there. That is a, you know, it adds up. It's not just JSON, it's the, the next library, the next the database library, et cetera. And it becomes a, a recurring theme in the objections, cha the, these things, what would, I, what would I prove? So the package repository is just where, to, where can I find something? The package manager is how do I download something? How do I grab something? That shows up. And library consistency, all over the place. Um, I don't think that anybody would, would, would argue this one in build tools. So, that's the result. Okay. So, with that, here's my interpretation. Now, I'm very careful here. I know, I, so, I've done econometrics and statistics. I know how fickle statistics are. They're very fickle. It's very easy to mislead. It's very easy to change a small thing and get a different result. Um, this is simply, these are some ob observations, user intuition. Intuitively, I agree with this. I've experienced all of this. So this, to me, is a confirmation of things that make sense. If you have a different experience, you can be skeptical, but the data is available. The results are available, the summarized results. And at some point, if I can suc successfully anonymize the other data, the, other, the, the upstream sources, um, that may be, may, may be available. I'm sensitive to privacy, so I, I, I've committed to keeping people anonymous in this. So. But the summarized data, which is completely anonymous, is, is available on GitHub. So this is my interpretation, but it's simply some thinking here. So we'll see. Garrett's general lowercase i impressions of Erlang. So people generally understand what Erlang is about. No surprise. I think the marketing and the communication that's gone on is good. Good, good job. It's extremely positive. People are enthusiastic about this language, and I mean really enthusiastic, shockingly. Like, when I say life-changing, I'm not exaggerating. There are some fans out there that are really personally invested in this technology. There is a general belief that Erlang is hard to learn and not learner-friendly. There is a general belief. It's reflected here in the result. There are syntax uh, complaints persist. This does show up. This surprised me a little bit. I, I thought that we would get a very low turnout. It's, I, don't, I think syntax, these syntax objections are ridiculous, but that's my personal opinion with respect. Uh, but they do show up. They show up. Okay. What is Erlang considered for? Servers, not surprising. That is network services, backend systems, demons, long-running processes. Things believed to be concurrent. Whether, you know, what, do, what does that mean? They use that word. Things to be, uh, require scalability, reliability, fault tolerance, whatever those things mean in distributed systems. So I think that the general jargon and the marketing, ma marketing message has gotten across. Again, one of the apps a bit of a surprise there. Um, this is not the telco 
inf you know, telecom platform. Um, this is you know, viewed as a general purpose platform for these things. Okay, challenges in adopting, finding developers is the outlier. People are concerned about committing to this technology when they can't find developers. That's reasonable, right? You're gonna go and, and bet your company on something that you, you can't execute on? I mean, that's pretty mechanically basic. And so if we're frustrated that there isn't much of a market for, for programmers, this is the concern. So think about this when we think about problems that we might define here. Um, it's considered hard to learn. There's a steep learning curve. It's arcane. Some, um, somebody used the term inside baseball, which I like. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I think it just means it's, it's sort of part of a, a closed group and it's difficult to understand, short of in a large investment in learning. The concern over uh, current levels of adoption, so that is, why am I going to bet my company on something that nobody uses? Now, for, forget about getting programmers. If nobody's using it, the, this just doesn't, not, doesn't, doesn't work. So reliance of uh, uh, cost, risk, et cetera. Convincing management is hard. We've talked about that. And then there's a, there is a strong dissatisfaction with libraries, documentation, tooling, often cited as the barriers to adoption. Okay, alternatives, JVM languages, Go, Haskell, none, Elixir, and actor and messaging library. So why do I show this? And let me, let me make a point here. I think a lot of people assume that Erlang is, is, is just so unique, and it is unique, and it's so differentiated, and it is, di it is differentiated. Uh, there's an assumption that people aren't, they just can't do, do anything with anything else. And that's just, that's, whether, well, whether it's raw, right or wrong, people disagree with you. Uh, people are trying and they're investing in other things, and as it turns out, you know, some of the problems that Erlang is really, really, really good at are edge cases for, for many people. They're extreme edge cases, edge cases that they may, may never reach. And so when we talk about adoption, sort of saying, well, Erlang is really, really good for this thing, and it, that thing doesn't resonate, or it resonates, but the, the barriers are too high that we've listed here. They don't use it. They use th things like this. I, 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 it should keep, keep us up, I think. Competition is not, not a bad thing. I think... Modesty and humility is a good thing. So knowing that there are other communities solving hard problems related to servers and concurrency, parallelism, we, th we heard talk uh, just in the last session about different concurrency models and how other languages are solving these problems. In fact, they are. And they're attracting brilliant people to invest time and energy in that. And there's a general, there's a general sort of underlying theme in the results here that say, Erlang had some things right early on, but there's a lot of catch up that's been done, that's been happening very recently. This problem with the computing platforms, and the need to be concurrent, the need to be parallel, the need to be, you know, support multi-core. Lots of investment are, is being made in other areas. We don't need to be jealous about that, but we should be mindful of it that, you know, we can't rest on the, on the laurels of the last two decades. Okay. Implications. I'm really starting to interpret here. I'm speculating. I don't know. Careful here. Careful. All right. Documentation is the outlier. Right, so primarily, this is, this is a target for change. So documentation is the outlier, primarily on how-to guides and examples. Package dependency management and repositories. These are things that we could think about maybe investing some time and energy in. And it's not, certainly, these aren't new. People, in fact, recently, there was a very long and extensive thread on documentation and usability and, and, and to, you know, how do you get started. How, and there is energy out there. But interestingly, a lot of people push back. They said, ah, it's fine. Just go to Erlang.org. Just use that. It's difficult. And people who are starting find that to be a barrier. So let's remove the barrier. Let's invest in the, the let's you know, maybe spend some time and energy thinking about this stuff. All right. Library consistency, build and release tools, improve the community and development process. There are multiple issues associated with this. So what I'm doing here is just targeting based on the results here. I don't think it's speculative. Right, these things jump out. So if these are if these are interesting of adoption and, and growth of the Erlang community, getting jobs, having a, a robust volatile market of, of Erlang employment is important. Um, these are things that we might consider looking at. So these are the this is again a, a high high level interpretation. Um, this is sort of me moving a little bit away from the hard data and giving you what I think is an intuitive feel. People are passionate about simplicity and not being complicated. And interestingly, Erlang has a rich, rich, rich tradition of not being complicated. So how do we find ourselves in a very complicated ecosystem? It, it, it's understandable, but maybe we should return back to this idea of beating, beating complexity out of, out of the language, the tooling, the documentation, et cetera, until it's easy for people, simple for people. Solve problems that have accumulated over the time. So library consistency and breadth 
know, we've been respondent to a certain customer base and a certain demand for very, very complex concurrent systems. Maybe it is time to be responsive to the community at large or, or to the general programmer and allow that type of profile to drive change. And so be responsive to people who are having difficulty and not to say, oh, you've got to push through this to get to the good stuff. Because what's going to happen is they're not going to push through to get to good, the good stuff. They're going to go to Go, which is very simple and direct. Go, go Lang, which is a tremendous resource for learning the language and using the language, and, and, and others like it. Uh, they want, this is interesting. This actually surprised me a little bit because I don't think about this that much, open, transparent, and growing community. But people who are making bets on technology look at this today. This today is a selling point. If you're IBM, you know, you, know, you t talk about all this other stuff. Today you talk about, hey, is there a vibrant community around a technology that's open and transparent? Right? Now, I understand that things are in flux, things are changing, things are moving in a direction. I'm highlighting that this is important to people. That's all. And increase adoption. So adoption here will lead to more adoption. It'll lead to more programmers. It'll lead to a richer ecosystem. So adoption is a bit important. All right. I'm going to get, I'm going to make sure I have, uh, this is getting a little bit repetitive. So let me, I want to get to questions first. And I just want to, I want this. This is what I want, because I just want to finish this. I'm going to get to questions. <clears throat> a lot of people uh, think, uh, who cares, right? Seriously, who cares? I can solve my problems. My colleagues can solve their problems. So it's proven. So let's move on. Let's not talk about the color of the bike shed. Let's solve some real problems. And that's a legitimate point of view. At the same time, the general openness and accessibility of a platform builds other things that are new and innovative. It attracts minds. It, it attracts energy. It attracts investments of time. So maybe one of the reasons that um, something isn't invested in by volunteers is that historically contributions have not made it into a certain area. I don't know, I'm speculating. I've certainly heard results and uh, you know, heard stories and the, the results about difficulties in getting code promoted and used. Not a criticism, it's an observation. The easier something it is, is to get in, those people will stay around. It will improve something. It will lead to another thing. It will lead to more contribution. And it'll start to snowball and grow and develop. Uh, I'm not an expert in this thing. Um, incidentally, my, uh, next step, one of my next steps is to look into community development. How have other communities successfully um, solved the problem of maintaining the culture and integrity of their ecosystem while being open and transparent and inviting and easy for other people to participate? Very difficult. I'm sure that's a difficult problem. I just don't know anything about it. So I'm gonna, I, I think I, I would like to, at the, the next step, to go measure that and talk to, talk to and, and perhaps conduct some surveys around uh, community development. I think that's interesting and I, I might spend some time on that. Um, so yeah, yeah. I think it's important that brilliant people not go elsewhere. I think it is important to, let's, let me put it this way, I think it's an important to attract brilliant people. I, 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 I agree with Katie Miller that it is important to have diversity, for diversity's sake. It's important to have things to choose from, it's important to have things to reject. You can't do that in closed homogenous circles. Things that are homogenous and overbred not, I mean, that, that's a bit of a derogatory term. Too homogenous, right? In an ecosystem, from an organism standpoint, they tend to die. Uh, you need heterogeneity, you need diversity to live. And that's just sort of principle from nature. Have there, has anyone seen the, the talk on self biology? Where almost all complex forms of life reproduce sexually. Sexual, sexual reproduction is extremely costly compared to cloning. But almost all complex organisms reproduce sexually. And the, the payoff there is diversity. That is a fact that is not disputed. If we have more diversity within the community, I think that we'll, we will uh, continue to improve and, and, and all of the goodness that we love so much uh, can be used and grow and uh, maybe we can get some, some more Erlang jobs out there. So with that, I'm gonna stop and ask for, uh, for questions. Oh, here are the references. Da -da -da. Uh, your questions. Go ahead. No, I'm uh, sorry. Um, ask the question, and I will repeat. I'll, rep I'll repeat the. I, I, we're not using microphone. Just I will repeat the question. They are. They are. I don't know why. I don't. I don't know. They are. 
I mean, honestly, at some point you can't, you know, I mean, there are reasons, and, and, and we, I don't know if we have the time to go through that. I don't even know if I know. I don't, honestly don't know. I mean, I can sort of guess, but all I know is it's cited frequently. It's extreme, like the number one outlier. Yeah, sorry. That's right. That's true. Um, so just to, for, the, for the record, um, the first question, I apologize, I didn't repeat it, uh, was, um, you know, you were just asking why is, you know, finding developer the number one priority, and my answer was, I didn't mean to be, you know, I, I truly, you know, don't, I don't know until you measure, so I just know that this is a big result. Um, and then the, the follow-up was an observation that, you know, managers ultimately make these decisions, and if it's difficult to find resources, it's really a, a matter of risk and certainly cost. Um, uh, it, there's risk to the project if the one or two or three individuals who are no Erlang go away, uh, it puts the project at risk, and it's also more expensive um, to hire and retain. Yeah, Joe. So the, que the question from, um, from Mr. Armstrong is, is, how does a community like Ruby manage to get away with a single library for something, when in fact there ought to be multiple alternatives? And I didn't get the impression that people were complaining about there, there being multiple versions. They complained about inconsistency and not knowing even what the high performance version would be to get. So it isn't a matter of them wanting to be limited to in choice. It's a matter of wanting something to be easy to find and easy to understand and easy to use. Yeah, absolutely. I, don't, I, I didn't get any impression that anyone had an objection with that. None. No one says, I want to be limited in what I do. That, that didn't show up. <laughs> no. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to, like, <laughs> So we're moving into, so the question is, you know, what is sort of, what is sort of how, yeah, what does hard to learn mean in this case? The granularity of this result does not penetrate that question. So I didn't differentiate between, you know, uh, is it, it was, in my experience, hard to learn versus it is sort of an, uh, you know, uh, uh, esoteric or exoteric question statement about this is hard to learn. They're both grouped into this. Um, I think the perception certainly would is, is you know either way would would, would maintain you know, somebody may be speaking on on someone else's behalf or or themselves so that's I listed that as hard to learn, and to be cle clear about this at least from what I've I've seen it's really more about how do I get my job done I, I could have put that a little bit differently um, it's a general category of hard to learn so it was learning curve and learning curve summarized basically. You know, how, you know, learning the low-level parts, but not so much that. It's more like, how do I use this thing? How do I, you know, I have this problem, how do I use it? I've got OO, I've got UML, I've got all these other things I've learned in school. And I, learned, I come to Erlang, and I've got sort of these things that I get, I understand it, but really using them, putting it into practice is a challenge. And you have to really commit and penetrate and ask questions. And that is, that seems to be the heart to learn there. So, so, so Joe's observation is that it has, doesn't have to do with, with Erlang, but it's the, the programming model itself. It's the higher level abstractions and the approach to, 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 to building software. True, um, but the observations are that the, the materials out there really don't address that very well. So the, so the joke... So the joke was somebody just asked Joe Armstrong if he found Erlang hard to learn, and Joe said no. <laughs> well put. Yeah. 
have you seen the core libraries? <laughs> have you seen, so the question was, uh, if I could elaborate on what uh, inconsistent libraries meant, and then I made a joke, which was, have you seen the libraries? Yeah, um, okay, so, 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 so um, for, for example, if you were, if you were to take, and I'll make another joke here, and I'm actually kind of dead serious about this, if you were to take the verb set, and you were to do a synonym on that, you might say put, or store, or insert, the Erlang core libraries use every one of them. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, exactly, yeah, I mean, it's a thesaurus. This is, yeah, yeah, sorry, uh, however you pronounce that word. Uh, yeah, it is, they are sometimes you put the thing being modified on the front, Sometimes you put it at the back. Now look, this isn't really a criticism. I mean, language, I mean, if you look at C, C++, every language has this problem. So it isn't to say that this is necessarily bad. It's just simply a, a point of friction. And, and for most of us, myself included, the cost of, of migrating a library for the sake of consistency is extremely high. I mean, look at what the Python community has done with Python 3. I know that was a noble attempt to sort of clean everything up, but I don't think that that went as well as I thought it would. There's extremely high cost. In, in changing something for consistency's sake. So I'm not for a minute suggesting that, oh, it's just a matter of cleaning up the libraries. I think that's a problem that we can, we can and if you go, I'll, I'll have these slides, I, I skip through that in the interest of time, um, but, but cleaning libraries up is a problem, and it, there's a trade-off, and it's a reason trade-off. And when somebody says, well, why is this so inconsistent? You can say, well, you want consistency or you want stability? Would you prefer that your code not work, or would you prefer to have a few challenges? And that's reasonable. So I'm not suggesting it's, it's, there's an obvious. This is certainly a problem for people. Uh, let, me, let me get what, yeah, Roberta. So the evidence that the last of the buckets has is that usable dependency. The language testing dependence is not really a problem for many because they will try to emulate. Would I try to emulate? So the question was, you know, the, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, incidentally, I, um, as being moderator, uh, have to remind myself that I'm out of time, and we have another question. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this up, and one more question. I'm gonna be, I, I'm the, I, I, I get the track, so then the next guy can go over. Let's do it that way. Ah, the pilots are the perks of being in control. Um, so the question was, you know, if the, if the package manager is listed as a problem, what would I, you know, think of or propose as an alternative? Um, I mean, there are certainly attempts to have been made to, to write a package manager. I think one of, the, one of the problems is that, you know, people would like these things to be so, so, so supported in the core. So that something like as endemic as, you know, build tools, package dependency, you know, dependency managers, package repository, that there be some sense of a central, supported, authoritative source, rather than a market of alternatives that might, may or may not surface as being the de facto adopted standard. That works, it has worked, we have tools that are generally de facto standards, but they're not officially supported, and people coming into the community don't know that. So they have to kind of figure out, oh, what's the, what's the trick to build? Is it a make file? Is it rebar? Is it you know, uh, um, Erlang.mk? You know, what should I do here? And then we've got this well-reasoned discussion of the alternatives. People don't care about that. They want to go build, done. Let me solve my problems. So that shows up all over the place. All right, one more question. Joe, what was your question? You know, for, you, well, you had something before. Oh, Ken, Kenneth. Yes, Kenneth, Kenneth gets 10 questions. So, um, so the question is, for folks who are sort of making the observation that it's hard to learn uh, and, and uh, there are these sort of challenges to adoption, um, are they able to do these systems in Java and C++? I don't have data on that, so I'm just going to, I'm going to wing it. I'm going to, I'm going to make up an answer for you. I think it's a reasonable answer. Um, <laughs> so, th it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There are th the problems that come up in Ericsson's ecosystem are outliers to the rest of the world. They are. They're, they're, people don't build these systems. They don't have this, this complexity problem. So the answer is yes, they actually can. They can get well down the, down the road. Look at the success of Ruby on the server side. Look at that's proof that people, whether they can or can't, they do it. And, 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 
and that's just a fact. So a lot of the times is it doesn't matter. They just use it, and then they run into the problems along the way. Erickson has a very, very different set of background, perspective. They understand extraordinarily complex problems and have a huge history of solving them. So the answer to your question is no, of course not. But to most of the people that are conducting the survey, it's, hmm, what are you even talking about? I don't know. Like, they don't know. They don't get it. Yeah, so the observation is that the productivity that gains that I think uh, that you can get will, will, will help you outstrip the, the investment in learning. I think that, that is probably true in a lot of cases, but I would say this. Is there really a problem in making something easier? Is there really a problem in chipping away at, at, at barriers and friction points? What's the problem there? I think all things equal, it'd be easier, to, you, know, you go that much faster, right? You'd save that much, you'd have that much more influx of people using the language and contributing and being feeling like they're part of the, the community. One more, Joe. So Joe Armstrong's observation is that there's a life cycle to language development and we're sort of at the point where you know, we have a basis and now it's time to start to, to write higher level books, patterns, and we're talking about some of the other things, how to, the domains of concurrent applications, et cetera. And I think absolutely. Um, to me, and I'll, I'll wrap up here so we can get on to the next talk, it really is about, let's, let's, let's be thoughtful about this. This is a form of being thoughtful about this. Um, and if we see something, maybe this would inspire some next steps. We can all let this evolve. Uh, but let's be rational about it, and, 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 and let's, let's, I think it would be great if we could all agree that building a, a richer, more diverse, more open community is something that we can strive for, and things like this, initiatives like this are worthwhile. Thank you. <laughs>